Thank you very, very much, Lucia. Our keynote speaker today is a Bruin alumnus and one of the nation's leaders in transforming the role of law and ethics in the business world. Dove Seidman is a two-time graduate of UCLA. He received both his bachelor's and master's degree in 1987 from the Department of Philosophy. He also studied at Oxford and earned his law degree from Harvard. And all things considered, we're willing to forgive him for straying to England and to the UCLA of the East. <laughs> Dove practiced law for all of two months before he quit to start a new type of legal business. He formed LRN, the Legal Knowledge Company, which broke the traditional mold of junior associates at law firms answering legal questions for clients. Instead, LRN uses a global network of 1,700 legal experts. It was an idea that Wall Street called a revolution. Through technology, especially web-based training, LRN is democratizing the understanding of law by teaching over 3 million employees worldwide to identify legal risks and to make decisions ethically. Dove, whose passion for life and whose commitment to the ethical life will be evident to you, is a Bruin who has walked where you have walked. For those reasons, and because his path is one that may guide us all, I'm very, very proud to introduce Dove Seidman. Please welcome him. <laughs> Chancellor Carnesale, Provost Copenhaver, Vice Provost, Deans, Members of the faculty, friends, parents, and most important of all, class of 2002. Thank you for having me here today. There are a few things the provost didn't mention about LRN. We could have chosen anywhere in the world but we're headquartered right here in Westwood. We could have picked any colors in the world, but we painted our kitchen blue and gold. We call it the Bruin, just in case anyone would mistake it for the colors of that lesser institution in the Berkeley Hills. We could have hired an intern from any college, but we chose Adam Hunt, who's graduating here today. Adam, are you out there? Congratulations, Adam, and see you Monday, 8.30, sharp. And finally, we could hire a few USC grads, but who in their right mind would even consider doing that? I am proud to be a Bruin, and thus especially honored to be here today. As I look out, I know what each of you is thinking, and I'm thinking the same thing. I don't know who you are either. <laughs> now, if I were Colin Powell, or David Letterman, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, I could wow you with my power, my humor, or with my accent. But I stand before you in a very different category, someone who would not have gotten into UCLA when you did. In fact, I almost did not get in at all. My high school transcript boasted A's, two of them, in phys ed and auto shop. My only chance to get into UCLA was to ace the SATs. No problem for a kid with dyslexia. I studied hard and got a 970. Or was it a 079? Anyhow, I bore down and I studied harder and my score increased dramatically to 980. 
My guidance counselor suggested that I forget about UCLA and look up the coast to UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> did, and they took me. <laughs> but I was determined to go to UCLA, in part because I couldn't afford college if it meant giving up my car detailing business in LA. Hey, it was a sweet job, and I really liked washing Lionel Richie's cars. It, it was the 80s. <laughs> so I begged, I pleaded, I filed the hardship appeal, and just one week before classes began, UCLA let me in. But UCLA thought so much of my talents that they made me take remedial English. And as a consolation, I had my choice of every class that wasn't already full. That left philosophy and philosophy. But if ever a seeming curse would turn out to be a blessing, it did so in my case. Growing up, dyslexia trapped my learning. It held me back in school. Suddenly, the world of learning opened for me by rewarding me for the careful consideration of one idea instead of for reading hundreds of pages of text. Philosophy helped me conquer dyslexia. It became my major and ignited a passion for ideas and ethics that remained central to my life. <laughs> Philosophy is also at the core of my company. At LRN, we apply philosophy, especially ethics, to the rough and tumble world of business. We train over three million workers worldwide how to deal with the legal and ethical challenges they face on the job. In so doing, we help workers do the right thing. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Doing the right thing. Of course, it goes without saying that the best reason anyone can give you for doing the right thing is that it's the moral thing to do. Virtue has been and always will be its own reward. But you don't need a lecture from me about morality right now. You've got your conscience for that, and your parents, and your rabbis, and your ministers, and Oprah, and Dr. Laura, and the Spike Lee movie. Hey, I'm not here to pile on. Instead, I'm here to share some bottom line advice that I think will help you get what you want in life. And here's the big irony. The most practical advice I can offer is also the most principled. It boils down to those four words again, do the right thing. Now, you may be thinking of heroes who do the right thing, like the brave men and women of 9-11 who gave their lives for this country, heroes who ran into buildings while others ran out, the men and women in arm's way tonight who volunteered to fight for what's right. We salute them. But today, I want to highlight a different kind of hero. People who do the right thing every day, even when no one is looking. Colleen Rowley, the FBI agent from Minnesota is one of them. She risked her career by writing a scathing letter to the head of the Bureau. In it, she raised fundamental issues of integrity, ripping FBI headquarters for thwarting the investigation into the man believed to be the 20th hijacker. Miss Rowley and others whose names we'll never know stand for the principle of doing the right thing no matter what the consequences. And this is the principle I want to impress upon you today. It's not just a moral imperative, it's a practical one. That's because the world is changing in ways that now make the ethical choice 
the practical choice. The world you are entering, as you know, is changing fast. In fact, since I began this speech, three Kmarts have closed, two Starbucks have opened, and Ozzy Osbourne has gone to the bathroom twice and closed the door once. The world is also changing dramatically. When you were a sophomore, some of you were probably eager to leave school, get stock options in a dot-com, buy your BMW, and maybe retire early. In your junior year, many of you were forced to hatch a new plan, to stay here as long as possible, to wait out the greatest recession in your lifetime. <laughs> hey, with Dee Dee Reese cookies still at 25 cents, you can afford to wait a while. In your senior year, all three pillars that give us a foundation for a life worth living, physical security, financial prosperity, and spiritual or ethical sustenance have been shaken. September 11th and its aftermath have created physical insecurity like nothing we've ever seen. The recession has undermined or delayed many hopes and plans for jobs let alone financial prosperity. But in the realm of ethics, things seem to be shaking most violently. Universal values like thou shall not kill and thou shall not kill thyself are blown up every day, calling into question the very foundation of what makes us civilized, let alone human. Our most respected institutions are themselves shaking with scandal at their foundation. The Catholic Church is grappling with its own sins. Arthur Anderson is undergoing a painful audit of its own integrity. Enron is now the largest corporate bankruptcy in history. And all around us, individuals are losing their footing. The head coach at Notre Dame resigns over a 25-year-old lie in his resume. A Pulitzer Prize winning professor is suspended for lying about serving in Vietnam. The president of the US Olympic Committee resigns over a PhD she never earned. An investment banker publicly touts a stock while internally calling it a dog and costs his firm $100 million in fines. All of these failures are failures of ethics. Failures large and small by people and institutions to simply do the right thing. Now, you might be asking, what does this have to do with me? I'm not a future hijacker or embezzler, and it's too late to plagiarize. I'm graduating. <laughs> it would be easy to draw a distance between us and them to assume that we're better and smarter than that. But what is remarkable is how much in common we have with them, how educated they are. The CEO of Enron has a PhD. He danced at the White House and slept in the Lincoln bedroom. Until they fell, we considered them paragons of success. And they probably believed they were acting rationally and practically. And the system out there seemed to reward their math until it all came tumbling down. In their comeuppance and in the pain it has caused others, you can see that the ethical equation out there is changing. Ethics matter more than ever. Even the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught, no longer applies. Everyone gets caught, it's just a matter of how soon, but why? As I see it, the main reason is technology. It's making life and work more transparent than ever. With email and cell phones, everyone is just a send button away from telling the whole world what you just did. A young American banker in Korea emails his friends about his sexual exploits. Quickly, the email across the globe ended up in the press and his boss's inbox. He lost his job and his reputation with it. Reputations now vanish overnight, and evidence of the mistake never goes away. It's always on some web page or database somewhere following you around, 
making second chances rare. What I'm saying is that in this world where nothing stays hidden, the only rational choice is to make sure you have nothing to hide. Now what if I told you that there's an added bonus? Virtue is now more than its own reward. Doing the right thing actually pays. Study after study has proven that ethical companies keep their employees longer, their customers buy more, and their revenues increase. But forget about studies. I'm sure you don't want to hear the word study ever again. I'm out there where you will be joining me soon. I can give you countless examples. Every day in my business, I see companies investing in creating a do-it-right culture, promoting employees who do the right thing, and firing employees that don't. So no matter what you choose to do, it's now more efficient to do what's right. Because they know you are honorable, people will give you incredible freedom to pursue your success. They will share opportunity and credit with you. Your reputation will precede you wherever you go, and you'll get ahead faster. So what does it really mean to do the right thing in a world as slick as that stuff in Steve Lavin's hair? It doesn't necessarily mean focusing on the superhero stuff. You know, fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. It means starting with the little things in life, writing a resume that reflects who you are, not who you think they want you to be. Not cutting someone out of a parking space just because you can. It's telling the waitress when she's undercharged you. It's calling your parents, and not just when you need some money. But it might also mean doing what's hard, even if it means turning down that job that you desperately need. Now wait a minute, parents. I know you don't want them to move back in with you, and I understand that for some of you graduates, just finding work feels like a matter of survival. But how long will you survive, and how much precious time will you waste in the wrong job, or at a company that does not focus enough on doing the right thing? So what will you use throughout your lives to make decisions both easy and hard, to deal with people both trustworthy and not, and to choose careers both practical and noble? I would suggest to you that you'll use your ethical compass, or I guess these days your GPS, or global positioning system. That GPS was formed at home on the playgrounds, and in the streets of your lives. But like mine, it was sharpened and tested right here at UCLA. You calibrated it when you decided not to cheat on exams, and when you ended a relationship compassionately. You honed it in Bunch, Royce, Life Sciences, Powell, Dodd, and all the other great buildings where you gained insight into the human condition, learned about extending your sympathies to others, celebrated differences based on class, culture, race, and gender, and explored the fundamental forces of nature which shape us all. Your legendary struggles with Murphy Hall taught you about give and take and dealing with powerful forces. And don't forget what you learned in the North Campus Cafeteria about friendship, romance, love, humor, indigestion, and the benefits of a good tan. UCLA has given both you and me not just the gift of a great education, but the gift of a strong ethical GPS. But is this gift enough? As we've seen, it doesn't guarantee that you'll do the right thing. That will depend on keeping your GPS turned on even when it's not convenient. Here, derive inspiration from the very floor of Pauley Pavilion, the winning baskets 
that put up all 11 NCAA championship banners. We're born not in a single play, but in the hours of practice, in the days, weeks, and months before. What makes the great athletes truly great isn't just their natural talents, but the discipline and practice they applied to make the play when it counted. They have validated Aristotle's teaching that excellence is not a single act, but a habit. I urge you to make doing the right thing not a single act, but your life's habit to become great ethical athletes. So when you leave this physical space, take the metaphysical with you. Strengthen the foundations of our lives by joining the quiet revolution of right over wrong. Start when no one is looking. Then, topple the belief that success is measured solely by money and create a new definition based wholly on character. Overthrow a world based on fear and replace it with one based on trust. Bring down the system based on expediency and build one up based on principle. And on this solid foundation, your dreams will come true. Your research will cure the blight of cancer. Your screenplays will touch people's hearts. Your software will bridge the digital divide and your arguments will serve justice in the Supreme Court. And some of you will do things that we have yet to imagine. Do the right thing. That's the most practical and principled advice I can give you. Congratulations, class of 2002. Good luck and have fun tonight. Thank you very, very much uh, for those powerful words.